tonight on Nova. Cliff Stoll, New Age Detective. What's up, Cliff? Hacker again. He's in an army base. What you gonna do? Call the army. A lone scientist on the trail of a computer spy. The hacker is out there somewhere, raiding computers, stealing government files. Hi, is Manning? Some computer hacker's looking for him. The true story of Cliff Stoll's real-life adventure featuring the actual participants recreating the events is the KGB, the computer, and me. I get it. Funding for NOVA is provided by the Johnson & Johnson family of companies, supplying health care products worldwide. And Lockheed, a bold new force in systems engineering, management, and technology services for defense, space, and industry. Major funding for NOVA is provided by the financial support of viewers like you. I'm an astronomer, a scientist who uses computers every day. I'm not a spy catcher or some kind of CIA agent. But somehow I found myself living inside a spy story. It had everything. A shadowy villain stealing government files and selling them to the KGB. An intrepid detective, obsessed with this case, hunting everywhere for clues. The hero sweetheart, his helpful colleagues, even the CIA. It led me into a maze of computers and electronic communication networks and ended in a foreign country far away. I was chasing a new kind of criminal, a hacker, sneaking into military computers, stealing secrets. As a scientist, it was bewildering. But in the end, it was science that showed the way out. Let me tell you what happened. It all started innocently enough, the first day in a new job. I was an astronomer whose grant had run out. Luckily, the lab hired me to run their computers. Dave Cleveland showed me around. He was a real wizard, someone who knew everything about the lab's dozen or so giant computers. This is the graphics one Physicists and astronomers used these computers for, well, physics and astronomy. My job was to make sure everything worked smoothly. It was about as far away from spies and espionage as you could get. They gave me a choice of two offices, a booth with a view of the Golden Gate Bridge or a small unventilated cubicle. I chose the cubicle. I had barely moved in when... Well, this is the monthly accounting report and there's a discrepancy. First time we've ever had a discrepancy in the monthly accounting. Really? Really? What we have to money or is it? Yeah, time money. Or? We have to charge for all the Dave said that there were hundreds of people who used the lab's we computers. They were charged three hundred bucks an hour, so the bills added up to thousands of dollars. Now, for the first time ever, his monthly accounts didn't balance. Well, at the end of that particular month, we had seventy five cents left over in charges that we had no one to bill for. And that was very frustrating because our programs, our accounting programs were very accurate and uh, we knew it, it wasn't a uh, rounding problem or something like that, or arithmetic error. We knew we, we didn't have someone to charge the 75 cents to. And what happened to that person? Where'd they come from? Where'd they go? And it uh, opened up a whole can of worms. Uh, Thousands of dollars in charges off by 75 cents. Didn't sound like much, but it was an interesting problem. A big error would mean an obvious bug in the system. Easy to find, easy to fix. 
But 75 cents? That's a challenge. The accounting system looked like a labyrinth, but I wrote some test programs and, amazingly, it all worked perfectly. So where was the 75 cent error coming from? I was looking at the list of authorized users when one name caught my eye. Hunter. This guy didn't have an account number. He must have used 75 cents of computer time and not paid for it. Well, I didn't know who this hunter was, so I shut him down. That was the end of it, or so I thought. The next day, a new problem appeared. A computer in Maryland, named DocMaster, sent us a message. Somebody in our lab had tried to break into their computer. Dave was supposed to find out who it was. He knew just what to do. Used to be that computers were isolated. Big computer here would solve one problem, this computer would solve another. Now, though, we share data from one scientist to another. And that means we need to network our computers. We need to send messages from one system to another, yet to another. Those computer networks form communities, form neighborhoods where one system sends information to another. And it's not just the computers that form the communities. The people using them are in one large neighborhood as well. Our networks are like a new kind of highway system. Once you get on a network, you can travel around the world. All you have to do is find a computer's network address and then call it up. You type in your account name and then your password. The password's usually not displayed to keep it secure from somebody looking over your shoulder. If you're legitimate, it invites you in. You can even dial up a network on a telephone line with your home computer. It all works great until somebody, a hacker, tries to break in where he doesn't belong. <laughs> By lunchtime the next day, I'd found Dave's villain. Only one person was connected from our lab to DocMaster at the time of the attempted break-in. Dave was impressed, until I told him who it was. Someone named Sventek. Sventek? Oh, that's impossible. Joe, is the professor down at the university here? A well-known computer scientist. He's worked here for years. A, a lot of us know him. He's not the type of guy to break into a computer. Besides, he's so good, we probably wouldn't have caught him if he had decided to break in. So much for being a computer whiz. Sventek wasn't even in the country, Dave said. Some local student must have stolen his account and used it while he was away. I wanted to teach this guy a lesson. Next day, I set a trap. My plan was simple. I'd get the hacker on the line and then trace him. Somehow. I programmed my terminal to beep whenever anyone logged into the lab. You'd be surprised how many people logged in. I was. This was some program. I wasn't catching any hackers, and I wasn't getting any work done either. At 12.33, my terminal beeped for the hundredth time.